I'm Graham Allison, and I'm glad to welcome you tonight for a very special forum event. Uh, this is the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at Harvard's Kennedy School. I'm the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. And the program you'll see tonight is the result of a co collaboration between the Belfer Center here at Harvard and SAFE, of, whom, of which uh, Robbie Diamond is the president. Tonight you're going to see a version of a war game, but it's an energy shock game. Now, war games were developed mostly by the U.S. military originally, but other militaries, for helping them play through a battle or a war and consider what they would do and what their adversary might do. In this instance, this is mainly a game for energy and an energy shock and you're going to get a chance to see the deliberations within the U.S. government by many individuals who've been in exactly the same situations, coping with an extremely difficult situation. So we're drilling down on a geopolitical landscape that's the consequence of this nation's dependence on oil. The cabinet represents, is, is being played by former cabinet officers, so Larry Summers is playing Secretary of the Treasury, Bob Rubin is going to be the National Security Advisor, and we've got an extremely distinguished group of people. And what we're trying to do tonight is to help us understand the consequences of energy dependence. This is showcasing an, a, a great undertaking that the organization SAFE has been about for the last three or four years. And tonight is kind of a culmination of an effort to create such cases, in this case specifically, and secondly, to do so in such a way that the case can be replicated by professors in other courses anywhere. And as a result of very uh, uh, extensive work on behalf of SAFE and in collaboration with the Belfer Center, there's this virtual case in a box that has DVDs with the material that you'll see today as well as the material. So Robbie will say something more about this. This has been a joint venture. Robbie is the president and CEO of Securing America's Future Energy Safe, and he's going to say a word about this event. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Allison. Um, let me first thank you. It's uh, such a pleasure and an honor to stand in such a prestigious room where so many of our world's leaders and American leaders have, uh, have been debating uh, the issues of our time. And really, we stand here as a nation on a precipice looking into the future and how energy security and our oil dependence will really determine our uh, foreign, domestic, and military policy uh, going forward as it has uh, recently in the, in the, in the past. And uh, we really are at, a, at an urgent time, and it's a call that uh, this is a need uh, for our economic and our national security. And SAFE was founded in order to both diagnose the problem using tools such as oil shockwave, as well as propose meaningful solutions. I'd be uh, remiss not to uh, thank uh, two people who are not here. Another project of SAFE is Ener the Energy Security Leadership Council, which is chaired by uh, Frederick W. Smith, who's the president and CEO of FedEx, and uh, General P.X. Kelly, the commandant of the Marine Corps. And uh, they have put forward bold policies in order to help solve this problem. Um, this, what you'll see today, is um, something we have done um, in many forums several times in Washington, D.C., as well as at Davos um, and at the Aspen Institute. And really, uh, uh, Dr. Allison here has played the Secretary of Defense um, in, in, sh in an oil shockwave. And after uh, both playing the role and then seeing it at Davos, we, we came together and we discussed how, how would we be able to make this available to students across the country. Um, and so we've put together this uh, box set that allows people to play one of three games with six different scenarios. And really, uh, you'll just see one, uh, one half of, of one uh, tonight. And, but what you'll see is basically what they would receive in this, uh, in this box set on the DVDs. And with it, will, uh, they're provided with instruction manuals and cabinet briefings. I just say to people here that um, basically this is projected forward into 2009, into late 2009. So it's not uh, taking place uh, today. Um, you'll get information on um, three different ways. The cabinet will. One is uh, news clips from GNN News. Uh, two are inject cards. The cabinet will receive uh, information that might be critical to their position. 
and uh, finally uh, staff briefings. Uh, the information that you'll see is all from government and industry sources and has been vetted by uh, military leaders, national security experts, and oil and gas uh, traders and industry experts. And so with that, um, I'll say that uh, time will be brief, but in many of these national security crises, there aren't a lot of times because the president needs answers. With that, let me introduce the oil shockwave cabinet. Thank you. Let me ask you to turn off your cell phones and Blackberries, please. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our simulation cabinet. Welcome back to GNN's coverage of a developing story out of Turkey where a brazen terrorist attack has left dozens of people dead and resulted in massive economic and environmental damage. Early this morning, a cargo ship hauling iron ore was hijacked by terrorists in the Sea of Marmara on its way to port in the Black Sea region. The hijacked vessel sailed at speed into the Bosphorus Straits where it then rammed a fully laden oil tanker that was sailing toward the Mediterranean. Both ships were badly damaged. The tanker is on fire, spewing oil from its ruptured tanks. The cargo ship has sunk in the main shipping channel after further explosions were heard, possibly from explosives carried on board by the hijackers. During the attack, a passing ferry carrying Turkish and other civilians across the straits was also hit by the hijacked cargo ship and it sank. Only nine of the 150 passengers on the ferry have survived. For details, we now turn to our reporter Nina Maria Potts. She is in Istanbul. Nina, what's the latest? Well, Simon, we have just confirmed that the Turkish Straits are now closing to all shipping. A spokesperson for the Istanbul Port Authority has informed the media that large oil tankers would not be able to navigate safely around the sunken vessel, and it will therefore have to be refloated and removed first, which, as you can imagine, is a daunting challenge. Now, obviously, this has a number of very serious implications for Turkey and the wider region, doesn't it? Well, as you know, the Bosphorus is a key transit point for vast quantities of oil from Russia and the Caspian oil fields uh, heading to markets in Europe. Apprehension about the damage this will cause to international oil markets is rising rapidly, as is the price of oil. Again, the, the sunken vessel will have to be refloated and removed first before normal traffic can resume, and um, it will take some time. So what is going to happen now? Are there alternative ways of getting this oil out to the global market? Well, oil analysts in London are saying that some Russian oil can be redirected north to a Baltic ports. However, the Russian pipeline system is already heavily loaded and it will take time for exports to be rerouted. And how much oil are we actually talking about here? Estimates are that 1.8 million barrels a day of crude exports, perhaps 500,000 barrels a day of product exports will be lost until the straits are cleared. Uh, but our sources on the ground here are telling us that um, for the straits to be reopened and for exports from the Black Sea uh, to resume, it might not happen this winter. Nina, stay with us for a moment. We're also joined now by our business correspondent, Suzanne Chislett. She's in London. Uh, and Suzanne, give us an idea of what's happening on the international oil markets. Well, Simon, due to the colder than expected weather in the Northern Hemisphere, we have seen an increased demand through December. Add to that today's attacks in Turkey. And forecasters are now predicting we will see a shortfall of around 2 million barrels per day come January, uh, even though we're expecting to see a slight decrease in demand because, of course, oil prices are very high at the moment. Now, that, despite Saudi Arabia's insistence this morning that it is going to be producing at near its maximum capacity. I gather the G8 is discussing the possibility of setting up some kind of high-level summit to coordinate international policy, is that right? 
Yeah, Simon, the advisory group is going to include government ministers from each of the G8 nations, the United States, Canada, UK, France, Italy, Germany, Japan, and of course Russia. It's also going to include the US Secretaries of State and Energy. Suzanne Chislett in London, thanks for that. Thanks too to Nina Maria Potts in Istanbul. We will be back with more on this developing story that is shaking the world's economy. Okay. First, let me thank all of you for getting together so quickly. As you know, there's a very serious situation evolving in Turkey, and the President has asked us to come back to him in about an hour and a half to get him ready for what will be a G8 meeting sometime in the next few days, and there are basically two sets of questions he wants to pose. Number one, what do we do with respect to the short term, and that's the most pressing and immediate set of issues, obviously. And then there is another question which he expects to have discussed in the G8 as well, which is, what kinds of measures should we take in the long run to deal with these kinds of energy problems? Before we do anything, though, we do have somebody with us from the National Security Council, Rand Beers, who will brief us on exactly what the state of affairs is right now. Hello, sir. Uh, Rand Beers couldn't make it, so Eric Rosenbach here is stepping in. I'll be briefing you on four important points. The first point is the strategic importance of the Bosphorus. The second is the impact of the attack on supply. The third will be the impact of the attack on the overall context of demand for the oil. And finally will be our assessment of prices in the future after the attack. On the first point, as I'm sure you all know, the Bosphorus has always been a strategic choke point throughout history, starting with the Russo-Turkish wars going through NATO and to today. Uh, today, nearly three million barrels of oil per day pass through the Bosphorus. That's the equivalent of about 5,000 tankers per year. The straits are very narrow, at some points uh, 70 meters, also very shallow, at some points 35 meters. When you make considerations about how to possibly remove the blockage, this is one thing you'll have to consider. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Very quickly on the impact of the, the terrorist attacks on supply. As you can see, uh, in December of the previous quarter, supply was exceeding demand. When you take away the supply from the Bosphorus exports, as you see in orange right there, uh, supply is now short of demand by a considerable amount. It's a possible that by March of 2010, this will be back up, but that depends heavily on whether the Russians, Azeris, and Kazakhs are able to reroute those exports through Baltic ports as opposed uh, through the, the uh, Black Sea. Next slide, please. This is all against the context of growing global demand. As you well know, demand has continued to go up. Uh, the mo majority of this is because of continuous growth from emerging markets like China. This is something that you will uh, have to consider and will continue on. Next slide, please. The final thing that you need to assess is our price projections for where prices will go. As you can see from the slide, we predict that by January uh, of next year, the prices will go to an average of $160 a barrel. These are our best estimates right now, but we have uh, our analysts at the Department of Energy continuing to work on that, and we'll give you updates as they become available. The one final thing I wanted to remind you on, sir, is oil is crucially important to the United States economy. We use about 21 million barrels of oil per day, 60% of which is imported, and 70% of the overall total used in transportation. 97% uh, of the transportation sector is based on petroleum reserves. Sir, that's it. Mr. Rosenbeck, thank, thank you very much. Why don't we begin with what I think is the most pressing question, or at least it's certainly what the President most wants to focus on, which is what do we do right now to deal with what has become a serious problem with respect to interruption of supply? And at least uh, one issue in this is should we consider the strategic petroleum reserve. A second is, are there measures that we could take with rail dispatch in the conservation area? And if we do, what are the political issues around that, which are probably not inconsiderable? And I guess we could start with, with those. Well, there is, a, I guess, a third issue, which is, how do we bring the rest of the world into this? There's going to be a G8 meeting, but obviously China has a great deal at stake. And how do we bring China, India, 
and the other rapidly growing emerging market countries into, at the very least, the conservation effort if, in fact, we're going to go down a conservation route. Why don't we start, though, with the Secretary of Treasury and try to give us some sense, if you could, Mr. Secretary, how concerned we should be about this in terms of our economy. And let me just, something that has mystified me a little bit is that three, four years ago when oil was at $30 a barrel, people said if it went to 60 it would be disastrous and if it went to 100 we'd have no economy left. As I recollected in 07 and 08 it did go into those kinds of ranges and yet we still had reasonably good economic conditions. In any event, give us a sense of how much the President should be concerned about this in terms of our economy. Anything could, anything could happen and this could prove to be a catastrophic event, but uh, my fundamental advice would be let's not do what every previous administration with an energy problem has done, which is do something really stupid that's made the problem worse. <laughs> let's not have, let's steer clear of crazy price controls. Let's steer clear of goofy strategies like the biofuels strategy that they pursued in 2006 and 2007 that created famine and food riots. Most of what needs to happen in terms of extra efforts to generate oil, in terms of conservation of oil, will happen because the price of oil has risen and people have an incentive uh, to do that. So yes, we shouldn't do anything with our strategic petroleum reserve right now until we've talked to all our allies about what they're going to do with their strategic petroleum reserves and figured out the right coordinated strategy. I don't think it's time yet to do that because I think that there's a good chance that the price of oil isn't going to be 160, it's going to be 210 and we're going to need the oil a lot more later than we do now, but we ought to work that out in conjunction with uh, our allies. So I think the most important thing right now is to make sure we don't flail and that we do engage in the right ways on uh, the geopolitics, that we talk quietly to the Saudis so that without quietly, people, administrations never are able to do that, so that they can produce more oil and help this situation without looking pushed around by uh, the United States. But the more we look panicked, the more every American is going to hoard gasoline and heating oil and the more the price is going to spike. So the most important thing we can do is stay cool and project cool. Well, let me, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary. Well, we just got a, an indication that we have to meet within 48 hours with the IEA. The executive director is calling a meeting to discuss coordinated plans. The system is very creaky, so we've got to get our own house in order and, and be prepared. We can stall there, of course, but that, we, that would not be a worthy news story if we are. But the two big issues that we on the table very clearly is, one, whether we have a coordinated drawdown and what our policy should be. I happen to totally agree with the Secretary of Treasury. We should defer but get everything ready so it can happen fast. But the second is uh, the Europeans will typically uh, start engaging in mandatory restraints in the, uh, on the demand side, which historically we have not. How much, uh, Mr. Secretary, how much of global oil supply is going to be taken off the market by what's happening in the Turkish Straits right now? Well, I thought we just heard that it was going to be something like 1.8 million, wasn't it, uh, yeah, or barrels per day. Area, right. But I'm not sure what the market's running right now and how much leeway we have on that. One presumes that you've got some spare capacity there, had been historically running about 1.5 to 2 million barrels with the Saudis. But uh, as the Secretary uh, uh, the Treasury indicated, we, we better be quickly talking to the Saudis to find out uh, how ready they are to start pumping. Yes, ma'am. While I certainly agree that um, taking a prudent course is the right one at this point, we can't also rule out the fact that this might be the first in a series of attacks. We have Zawahiri, who's already stated publicly a number of times recently that uh, he believes that the oil infrastructure in particular is fair game. And so as we think about what our next steps are, we need to also uh, be thinking about what happens if there's an escalation of attacks. Well, but let me, let me, yeah. Secretary of State. Sure. Um, I just wanted to bring you up to speed on a few of the diplomatic in, uh, initiatives that went on this morning. I've got two main immediate concerns. Uh, the first is I did have a conversation with my Saudi counterpart, Prince Saud. Um, it was a very unpleasant conversation in the sense that the Saudis are really 
uncomfortable with how we're handling ourselves in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, he made a number of assertions that our policies are actually uh, breeding this kind of extremism. And he said that if we're going to look to Saudi Arabia to bring on more spare capacity um, into production, that they would be looking to us to make a few changes. And he mentioned specifically opening a direct dialogue with Hamas. So I think we need to think about whether or not we want our policy to uh, be held hostage to that. My uh, initial consultations with my ambassador and assistant secretaries would be that that would not be a wise thing. On the second front, on Turkey, um, my immediate concern here again is that domestic politics in Turkey don't get inflamed by this. Um, we don't know who has done this attack and I would think that we want to make sure that the Turks don't take it as an opportunity to go after the PKK again. Um, I've talked to my counterpart, Ali Babakan, this morning, and Turkey is now saying that they're reluctant to uh, promise that they're going to open the straits again unless they have more progress in EU membership. So um, I, I really think we've got a bunch of complicated factors on our hands here, and uh, I'd just like to interject that into our discussions early on. Madam Secretary, even if they wanted to open the straits, is it technically possible to open it in the relatively short term? Well, the communication I got from our embassy in Brussels is that there's just beginning to be some intense discussions there and the Europeans are getting a communication that the Turks are going to try to use this as leverage. At this point, I don't have any information about how long it will take to reopen the straits, but um, perhaps our Secretary of Defense might have a better sense. Well, the assessment that we were just given was that it's going to take some time, some months, uh, for that uh, tanker to be refloated. So we're looking at something that is long term here. And I just want to uh, uh, reiterate what the DNI has just said. Uh, this could be the beginning of a chain of events. And so I think we need to take that into account. And that means uh, uh, taking actions to secure other oil infrastructure from potential uh, attack. Now, that's something that we oughtn't to do. Uh, ourselves. That's something, and I think the Secretary of State said this, and the Secretary of Treasury, this needs to be a concerted uh, uh, action, but we do need to position ourselves to protect that infrastructure, and it's very important that we don't do that all by ourselves. But let me test Let me test a question, if I may. The Secretary of Treasury suggested uh, holding up on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but let me let me try it this way and see what people's reaction is. The other possible approach would be to say that we want to diminish or reduce our, our short-term vulnerability as much as possible since we don't know how long it's going to take to open the Turkish Straits and we also don't know what else might happen around the world. And therefore, <coughs> what we should do is implement conservation measures as rapidly as possible and also begin to use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We have, what, 700 million <coughs> barrels or so in the petroleum room? Yeah. So you could use some relatively small portion of that each day and begin and take pressure off yourself to make yourself less vulnerable if there's another set of events and also less vulnerable to what's happened already. Anybody have a reaction to that one way or the other? Either a substantive reaction or a political reaction? Well, on the conservation side, I think we're, it, it's very clear by now that television coverage will be telling everybody there's a problem in the marketplace. The Europeans have just announced there's two million barrels short in the world market. Now, frankly, there's nobody who can know that figure, but that's what they're uh, claiming. So this is going to be broad news. I think what we have to do is begin rapidly encouraging the American people to take action. But the first immediately response is to fill up the gas tank, and since they're only about a one-third full on the average in this country, you have a huge draw. You'll have immediate shortages in a number of uh, places, and it's very important that our communication strategy help people understand that, in part, we'll create a crisis instantly on top of a crisis that we've got, no matter what we do, frankly. Secretary of Treasury suggested not acting precipitously or foolishly, which is probably is a different <laughs> proposition, good idea. reasonably good advice. But, <laughs> but I, I guess my, my question still would be, should the President strike more of a note of we're looking at a set of possibilities and we'll get back to you sort of thing, or should he strike more of a note, we're being faced with a very serious problem and here are a set of measures that I'm going to take in response to that, and calling, including some kind of a call for national conservation with all the difficult politics around that and then lay out a set of proposals. You could have a national sp uh, speed limit for a little while or something of that sort. I think I'm going to lose this argument, but, I, but I, I think everything you're talking about 
would be a big mistake. If we use the, if we use the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, what's going to happen is it's going to be happy times for the hedge fund community. We're going to push the price down. They all know this is getting worse later. They're going to think it's a fantastic opportunity to buy oil while the government's selling it cheap and hoard it for the problem when we, for the moment when we've got the big crisis later. And all you're going to do is make a subsidy that the government could have earned when that oil went up by giving it to a giving it uh, to a bunch of uh, bunch of traders. As a former trader yourself, Mr. National Security Advisor, <laughs> you're aware of what can happen when the government tries to stabilize markets. It doesn't usually work out very happily. Conservation, uh, maybe, but if we let the price go up and it's much harder for people to use energy, they'll figure out that it's more expensive to take that trip. They'll figure out what the best ways uh, to be uh, more efficient are. If we start the approach that's being recommended, strategic petroleum reserve, conservation, panic, was Jimmy Carter's approach. And that approach pr produced pervasive gas lines, pervasive panic, and projected to the world a sense of American impotence. The truth is we have a remarkably robust economy that it will address if we let market forces operate the fact that there's less oil in ways we wish this hadn't happened but if we try to pursue a bunch of hyper aggressive policies about conservation we will create panic we will create lines we will not solve the problem we will look more impotent I, I, I have a impression that you tend to disagree with the thrust of my question. <laughs> uh, but I think this is the issue we do need to frame for the president. Uh, I'm just the honest broker without a point of view. But I, I think that, let me ask you this, Mr. Secretary, if I may. If we don't begin going down the track that I, I just said, and oil does spike to the $160 a barrel, which I, I heard you say you think unlikely because that would affect demand one thing or another. I mean, that's one possibility, let nature take its course. And the other would be to release, say, a million barrels a day or something like that from the 700 million that are in the SPRO and put in place a set of conservation measures which might also, this is, by the way, this is, not, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to pose questions, <laughs> not suggest the view, but it's another track for the president to go which might also deter, I, I don't know how realistic this is, but deter others around the world from trying to interfere with other parts of the energy producing infrastructure because they'll see that we're less vulnerable than we would be if we simply let nature take its course. That, that's a, a one point of view. The other would be the one that you suggested. Yes, Madam Secretary. Um, I'd just like to weigh in on two points here. First on the conservation. Um, I would really like it if we would be able to recommend to the President that he go to this G8 meeting with a package of conservation measures that America is going to take simply from the position of exerting some global leadership. If we look for the silver lining, potential silver lining in this crisis, it would be that you would have producers produce a bit more and consumers consume a bit less. And I think we're going to have to do something to demonstrate that we're going to be, we're going to be leaders here. Um, the second point is more uh, back to what the Secretary of Defense mentioned about prepositioning to make sure that we don't lose any more uh, supply. And I just wondered if he could tell me what you're thinking of uh, simply because I'm concerned about the Straits of Hormuz and if you're thinking about putting more U.S. naval uh, presence there, we're going to have some coordination issues with Iran and I'd like to get some ideas on the table about how we could handle that. I think I understand that 17 million barrels of oil a day pass through that area. Well, we have uh, indications, as I understand, that there are others, we don't know yet who perpetrated this uh, incident, and there are groups like the PKK, which wouldn't necessarily have a global agenda. But if it's part of the Al-Qaeda agenda, then it is likely to be global, and that means that there's a potential threat to shipping elsewhere. And there are actions that we can take, for, in, for example, escorting uh, tankers and so forth and increasing uh, surveillance. We have to take some time to position forces to do that. So if you want to have options down the road, if there are subsequent events, I need to know that now. And again, I said this earlier, it's important that we not take any of these kinds of actions in a conspicuous way that is by ourselves. The spirit of this whole thing is we're all in this together. This is a global market 
and it's a shock to the global market and if things get tougher down the road you want to have the Europeans and the Chinese and the Russians and so forth involved to, the, uh, to the extent possible. Madam Secretary, how, how do you go, this is a question, that, and if, if you want to go to the G8, and that's one debate, whether you do or don't go with conservation, right. is that politically feasible if we haven't brought China and India and others into this in some fashion or other? And, if, and, it, and whether, whether it is or it isn't, obviously you do want to bring them in because they themselves are large consumers, and how do, why does one go about doing that? Well, you may have spoken with the President about this at greater length, but I would be interested in getting others' views about whether we could propose this be an expanded G8 meeting to bring in China and India, because I think we really we do need them at the table, and I think this is an appropriate moment um, to really galvanize the, the international actors here. So I'd like to get the Cabinet's impressions on that, but that would be my proposal, and I've had some contact with our ambassadors in Beijing and um, and uh, New Delhi this morning, and they thought that this would be, you know, this would be a good moment. And again, to underscore that point about this is a global problem, and we need a global solution. This is not a U.S. problem. It's not even a European problem. And I guess that would help, the obviously, related to the question of Secretary Defense. I would raised. prefer not to take actions that are right. reported as us taking right. protective actions all by but ourselves. If, I, if I could interrupt for a moment, we have a, we have a, uh, an incident that uh, is being reported by our station chief in Riyadh. The Saudi liaison service has told us that there uh, may have been an attempt to attack an oil tanker at a port in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they, the attack was not successful. They don't intend to make it public. But again, we are seeing additional indications of uh, further attacks. This was an effort to it, or said to be an effort to attack an oil tanker? An oil tanker at port in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Hey, can I th just jump in for a second? Because we have now maybe an hour before we go and sit and talk to the President about what his options are, and we can have a uh, theoretical discussion about policy, but we've got to get to what are we going to tell him he needs to do. So first and foremost, it seems to me he's got to assert his leadership. He's got to go out and lead the world, literally. And, but we have to coordinate that. Uh, we have to coordinate what he's going to say with our allies so that they can reinforce that. Uh, so it seems to me whether some of, some of these short-term ideas are good ideas or bad ideas, we need some short-term ideas. We can't have the president go out and say that the market will take care of this. It's not politically uh, uh, sensible at this point. Uh, uh, to take that approach. So it seems to me we, we ought to try to figure out what is a short-term, uh, what are a couple of short-term things we can say and we can agree as a, as a group to recommend to him so we can get out a little bit ahead of this uh, and then figure out how that fits into the broader context of the energy crisis, the president's energy program. Do we use this now as the springboard? Do we bring others in? But I think to have, you know, we'll, be fin we'll see him in an hour. He's going to have to see the press within an hour after that, and we've got to decide, uh, you know, you know whether uh, what short-term steps we're going to take. Anything from what the Pentagon can do to help bring that ship up, what we're doing as far as protecting other things. We have to have him assertively say these are things we're doing right now to address this. Uh, otherwise, this thing will eat us up. We've already got members of Congress going out on camera saying, "Where's the president?" Um, I, I think we really need to settle the question of the SPR because there, no president can get up in front of the microphones without being pressed heavily on it. It strikes me the best policy is for us to simply say we will be prepared to act when we think it is the appropriate moment. This is not it given the potential threat to the marketplace. And, and, and so we are going to be coordinating very closely with the Europeans. First of all, it should not be done without that coordination because we're, we want this. But at that point, he will be ready to act, but not to do it, but get the machinery all geared up so it can uh, uh, do it, but do not do it, do not trigger it now. Mr. Secretary, what, what, all, what an analogous resources does the IA have in Europe and well, Japan? Well, uh, Germany and Japan, of course, have uh, public stocks, and the other uh, European countries are committed to at least forcing their private companies to hold stocks that, in theory, will be available. It's not, again, clear all of this is available, but there is a, a coordinated drawdown. We've done that before in a coordinated way, a very limited way. Uh, but um, we've got to quell the idea of there's going to be huge pressure for us to act quickly and precipitously on the Strategic Petroleum Service because there's one thing people know about, and it's the one thing you, in theory, can do. But I think it's a high-risk policy to and pull it trigger. Mr. Secretary, <coughs> with 700 million 
barrels, roughly speaking, if I'm right. correctly, in <coughs> the patrol, strategic petroleum reserve, what is the disadvantage well, of taking down, say, half a million barrels a day or something of that sort, and having the IAA, IEA rather, match that from around the world with another, say, million barrels? Well, million first of all, you might not have much impact. <laughs> um, Bob's already indicated the, uh, the potential difficulties of the market, just eating that up and driving the prices up and uh, kind of proposition. And we don't know what is coming. Uh, you, you could, you can do that and you can make that symbolic move, but in two weeks when there's no uh, impact, unless it just happens to work perfectly, then you've got everybody screaming, what, you didn't do enough, you didn't do enough, uh, more, more, more. Well, if, if it's, this is a question again, if, if, what's taking, if what's being taken out of the market is two million barrels a day, which I think was roughly speaking the amount, right? Well, that's what the claim is, but uh, Ms. Ms. I tell you, there is no way to know exactly how much is in that marketplace. <laughs> this this data system is very, very well, incomplete. Well, I was talking about the, the interrupted uh, passage through the Turkish Straits. Yeah, Wasn't that was 1.8, I think. 1.8, it was, so call it, okay, 1.8. <laughs> so if you, <coughs> if you replace that with a million and a half barrels a day from the SPRO plus the IA resources elsewhere, you'd have roughly speaking an offset in the market, and then you had some conservation, you could actually, in terms of supply and demand at least, offset the effect of this in the relatively short term. I'm not saying we should or shouldn't. I'm trying to test why, why, why should we not recommend that to the President? Because I think, one, you may need it later, <laughs> and we don't know what's coming. Uh, it's very difficult. Two, I think that mathematical calculation is highly improbable. I just don't think we know how the marketplace is going to absolutely respond to it. If you wish to now and you wanted to do that symbolically, you can take action and prove you're acting, but I'm not convinced it's a smart strategy. And what would you do on, on the score of conservation? You wouldn't act on that either right now? Frankly, most of the options we have are highly uh, unworkable, but we could call for a national 55-mile-an-hour uh, uh, thing if we want to. Frankly, that's c calculated on 1975 kinds of automobiles. I don't know that anybody's updated that data, have any idea whether or not that average gets you a gain or not. Uh, and it sure as heck will be highly unpopular in the western part of the United States. I, uh, I'm, I'm concerned here we're doing the math too finely. What we just heard is that we may have something in Saudi Arabia. The cushion here is Saudi production. That's bigger than anything we do with the SPRO. It's a, and if something happens there, that's bigger than anything we say today. So I think whatever we say now, given the news we just heard, needs to be framed as the beginning of something that could be bigger. And where would that lead you in terms of, look, we have to go see the President in less than an hour. And, and I think the threat has become clear from this discussion that the threshold question is we sort of let things develop a little bit and let the markets sort of let's see what happens in the markets and how that affects adjustments, or we do something much more proactively. And that, where would that lead you in that space? Uh, that would lead to, if, 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 if the uh, Secretary of the Treasury's advice is taken for now, it be framed as for now, because we're getting right. indications that things can get a lot worse. And you don't want to look like you weren't able to anticipate how bad things could get if things do so I understand the urge for calm, but I also don't think you want to look like you're a day late and a dollar short if what we just heard about is the edge of something bigger. Saudi's bigger than, any, than, than the Bosphorus, and it's bigger than the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, no, was, I think it's an absolute given that the President has to have a package uh, that is laid out across government of what we're doing and what our allies are doing to secure uh, against a further attack. I don't know what that is, and I don't know what can be put together in the next hour, but he, he has to have that. The SPRO well, is an interesting uh, policy five, debate. Five, five. We, we may do that, we may not do that, but there are a couple of things that we have to have just to put him in the game uh, here, uh, and, and it, there's gonna, that, that has to be there given the exact point of anticipating this as it comes. Let, let me deconstruct that, if I may, and ask you a question. When you say he has to be in the game, which I guess you mean proactively yeah. engaged, you're talking about with respect to the supply demand factors, which are the SPRO or, or conservation, or are you talking about prepositioning and trying to protect infrastructure around I, the world, I, or I, both? I think it's both. I think there's, I think given what we've heard, uh, the president has to be uh, seen as someone who is anticipating the next shoe dropping. I think as we go forward, uh, so that's a minimum. And frankly, that's not a big political debate. There, there are things we can do 
and the debate is over how much we can talk about the things we can do. And, and that's, a, that's an interesting debate and, uh, you know, people will be pushed. I think on the, when you get to conservation, I think there is, there are some, uh, w w we have to, you know, even being able to say, I've asked the Secretary of Energy and Secretary of Energies across the world are drawing up a plan on how we do this is, a, is, is it maybe a minimum bid here. Madam Secretary. Um, I'm very comfortable with the President saying that we're talking with our allies about how to meet this production gap, but let me just lay a little reality on the line is that we've got major tensions with other non-energy policies. All of the countries that we would look to, uh, especially if we find out that this incident in Saudi Arabia takes Saudi uh, production capability off the line, I mean, we can look to Mexico and Canada. But frankly, you know, Congress's efforts to renegotiate NAFTA is really causing, you know, a lot of tension with those countries. The UAE and Kuwait, um, we could go and ask them to try to eke out some more uh, production there. But they're pretty upset about congressional hearings about using their sovereign wealth funds and putting uh, some, some legislation, putting the kibosh on that. So we've got a lot of non-energy related foreign policy issues that are going to make it quite tough to talk to some of these potential uh, excess producers right now. I mean, it, the President can say we're in consultations, but I don't want to overplay what we're going to be able to extract, especially if uh, we don't grapple with some of these Saudi and other demands. And the, the, the other piece of this is, you know, we've got to remember there are 535 Secretaries of State <laughs> who, just down the road who all want something. They're already calling for the release of the SPRO. It's on TV. We, we, we have to be, have enough in whatever the initial foray is here, whatever the initial statement is, to calm them down. Uh, otherwise, that that will just it will overtake our ability to deal with this. You know, you raise, an interesting, you raise an interesting question, Mr. Counselor, which is if the President doesn't do enough, is there a risk that there will be a very large set of initiatives coming at him from Congress? Or to put the same thing differently, how does he get control of this process as opposed to it being I think he gets control dominated of the process by others? By, by going out quickly and showing that there's one person who is, <coughs> who is in charge here. But again, I think there's, there's, there's a leadership test that he, he will pass because we'll give him the advice to pass that. There are a series of short-term things we're doing, and we may only be able to settle on preventing future things. Uh, and then we have to have a, a debate and probably bring you know, some other people in here about how do we frame this more broadly going down the conservation road? How do we take this and without uh, looking opportunistic, see this as uh, an opportunity to push where we're going? So um, let, let me, oh, I'm sorry. Nope. <laughs> uh, very quickly, though, I think on the congressional thing, we've got to be a little careful here. They're not going to be able to get their act together. Uh, the nice thing about 535 secretaries of states is they have 535 different policies. So you know, don't expect them to be able to get their act together, but they are going to be extremely energized. They already are. We've begun, and I trust the congressional liaison for the White House has begun, too, uh, we've asked each of the committee chairs and vice chairs on the relevant committees to identify the key staff person that we can be in quick and daily contact with so that we can uh, keep them informed of what we're doing and asking them what they think we ought to do uh, and keeping them engaged. And partly that engagement is going to be very important to quelling any of this activity. That doesn't guarantee anything, but uh, I don't disagree with Joe that we've got to have some things on the table. But this is a developing proposition, and if what we come out of, out of the box uh, will we'll easily be shot down if we're not careful. Well, whatever, whatever we do, we, eat, we at least have to create the impression that, that congressional leaders are involved in this process. Absolutely. So they will have to be in this building at some point Absolutely. today with the President. Mr. Secretary. Bob, here's, here's my thought listening, listening to all of this. Uh, I think Joe's absolutely right. The President's got to come out, look like a leader, have a set of things that project a sense of concrete motion. That's right. We need our jobs to figure out how we can do that while doing things that are productive and not doing things that are counterproductive. I'm hearing six things that he ought to convey uh, very quickly. First, there ought to be process stuff about how he's meeting with Congress, he's meeting with business leaders, he's meeting with stakeholders, and so uh, an agenda of how he and we are going to be reaching out to all the stakeholders is the first part of it. Second, there's got to be some reassurance here. If there isn't reassurance, everybody's going to fill up the tank and the price is going to be 225 tomorrow. 
there's got to be reassurance. He needs to tell people that the price of that we've seen energy price fluctuations before, that the American economy is remarkably resilient, and that we can manage our way through this. So the second message is there has to be reassurance. And then it seems to me we've got four areas of policy. One is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, where the Energy Secretary and I are in agreement that the worst thing we could do is prove our impotence by uh, releasing it right now with likely negligible impact, especially since oil's not just oil. There are a lot of different kinds of oil. And when we study this for another four hours, we're going to learn that the particular thing that got blown up was some particular category of refined oil, and its price is spiking. And we can put all the crude oil into the system that we want, and the kind of heating oil that works in a certain place, which is where we lost the supply, isn't going to go down in price uh, at all. So <coughs> what we should do is indicate that we are consulting with our allies as to how best to mobilize reserves in a strategic way so that we use the, use, uh, the prospect of strategic petroleum reserve as a sort of Damocles over the market, but we don't shoot our bullet and potentially not get the target and take a risk. That will project the motion and it will protect um, our options down the road. Second, we need to go beyond this idea of a flailing Carter-style conservation by saying we need a comprehensive review of national policies as they impact energy. Maybe some of those, maybe those, some of those power plants that used to be using oil, that used to be using coal that we forced to use oil, maybe for a little while they can use coal again if we've got a crucial problem with the supply-demand balance. I got no idea whether that's the right policy or not, but the president needs to open this up in a broad way, not just to conservation, but to more effective use of all of our fuels. Then there's the pieces that I don't know much about as Secretary of the Treasury, but it seems to me there's a national security piece around protection of supplies, and there's a diplomatic piece around consulting with our allies on the medium-term uh, strategy. And what we've got to do, I think, is I think if he addresses each of those six points and he numbers them and he says, you know, there's six crucial aspects of our policy, I think we can get through this and the very act of him speaking in a reassuring way will project a sense of concrete forward motion. If I could add, I, I think those are excellent points, but I would add a seventh, and I realize that as the National Security Council, we don't have the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security here. However, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near the Port of Boston tonight if, uh, if I had indications that there were pending attacks in the U.S. that could be carried out. And there is no way in this body to bring those two pieces together. So I think he has to make the point as well that he's taking all uh, actions to secure the U.S. infrastructure as well. Uh, let me add one other point, which is, I think, crucial. I, I don't disagree with uh, what uh, Larry was saying. But there, there's another point here, which is, you know, the, these, these gas prices that are now under the microscope have been high for a while, have had an impact, have had a, 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 a degrading impact on middle class families around this country. It's one of the reasons why our president got elected uh, the, the way he did. We have <laughs> to, we have to indicate that the, the president understands that this just didn't start today and this isn't a policy, a right. clinical policy debate, that he understands that people have been living this problem, you know, for four years, you know, for several years with, with gas, un, uh, for them, unacceptably high. And that's got to be a piece of, of, of what he comes out and says. I think what we ought to do is, um, as I think about this, I, I think I'm the only one of our whole group that has a slightly different view than, than the Secretary of Treasury does about what we ought to do. But we can present this to the President and we can take the view that I think is the prevailing view and then we can take my minority view, and, which is a somewhat more activist view. But let me ask you this. Let's just switch the, the focus for the moment because if on top we already have serious additional efforts were made to disrupt supply in the Mideast or elsewhere, that could greatly compound this problem. Do you think that we should, Mr. Secretary, should we try to move ahead of that? Should we wait? How do we, as you said, to do it unilaterally has all kinds of problems associated with it. How do we bring the rest of the world into this? Maybe between the two of I'd, the Secretary of State. Secretary I'd, I'd go back to what the Secretary of State said, and she's repeatedly said that this is something we need to do with, in concert with others. She said something else which is very concerning to me, which is that she's already received some indications from the Saudis and possibly from the Turks of 
of countries trying to use this, this global emergency to local advantage. Now, there was a phrase used in another context once upon a time, if you're not with us, you're against us. <laughs> and <clears throat> in a nicer way, there needs to be that spirit surrounding this. This is the global economy that depends upon a global market. If this was done by Islamist extremists, we were the intended target. But in fact, the world is the victim. And we need to uh, work on the solidarity uh, here to take away the objective that was evidently intended uh, in this act and all of our options downstream are ones that depend upon others being with us. Let me give you the example. If the Saudis aren't with us or they find it politically impossible to remain with us, uh, we're in, a, we're in a tight spot. So that spirit, I don't know whether that's a number seven or whether that was num your number six, is terribly important. You know, you raise a very interesting question, Madam Secretary. The oil-producing countries of the Mideast is just one example, but some, or Russia would be another example of the same thing. Are they likely to look at this as an opportunity, we can get much higher prices, or are they going to look at this as a threat, this can disrupt the global economy, which obviously could be a very serious problem for them? To say nothing of the fact that if there are further developments, those further developments could be in their part of the world. Well, this ties back into our earlier conversation. I certainly think the initial indications I have are that the individual countries are looking at this as an opportunity, but the Secretary of Defense's point is exactly right, that if this is looked at as a global crisis, it hurts producers as much as it will hurt consumers. I mean, producers have every interest in the integrity of the global oil market. So I think what we need to do, again, is to talk to producers as a conglomerate, as a group, rather than try to figure out what they want to extract from us individually. And I suspect what we're going to hear is that producers are tired of us looking to producers to solve these kinds of problems and that if we can show as consumers that we're willing to take some steps as well, that we give on the consumer side, we can maybe get some give on the producer side, I think we'll be more successful rather than to appear, hey, we've got this big problem and we need you to take some steps to fix it. But, but, but Madam Secretary, would that lead you to take Secretary Treasury's suggestion, which is, I thought, very well framed, but, but lacking or yeah, lacking in immediate action for the reasons he explained, or would it cause you to be more inclined to recommend immediate steps in the President's address to the nation? Well, I'm a little nervous with all due respect to the Secretary of Treasury about um, suggesting that we're going to have a commission to look at policies. I think that's going to lack, you know, the impetus that is needed right now. So maybe if that's done in conjunction with these other steps, it could be sufficient. I really do think that the onus will be on the president to demonstrate some American leadership here. And maybe we don't need to make every proposal now, but we should make some proposals that indicate that we're willing to look at this problem differently than we have in the past. I think that's going to be very key, and not just for Middle Eastern producers, not just for those conversations with China and India. They consume far less than we do, and if we're going to look to them to take some measures to regulate their demand, we have to show leadership but first. What are the, but Madam, Madam Secretary, do you really believe that if we have a 55-mile-an-hour speed limit or we say that people aren't allowed to drive on Sundays and or Fridays because we're going to have a four-day week so there's less commuting, do you really believe that the Saudis are going to produce more oil because we do those things? I don't believe that those individual measures will, but I think part of this is how do we get a spirit of global partnership? That's what we're trying to get going here is a sense this wasn't an attack on American economic interests, which is exactly how Al-Qaeda will want to per portray it. And so perhaps those individual measures, if that's the only two things that the President says. What types of things? I guess I'm trying to, I mean, I, I hear this stuff about, I hear this stuff about conservation, and I, yeah, I do see it through the Carter prism, uh, which didn't work so well. But maybe I'm not understanding it. I mean, the only example we've heard so far is the 55 mile an hour speed limit. Um, I'm trying to get a sense of what are the what are the conservation measures that you that we could be taking that you think somehow are going to inspire the rest of the world here. Well, I'd like <coughs> to turn to the Secretary of Energy on that, but I, I also think that maybe getting Congress to step forward and say we're actually going to take. Uh, action on some of these pieces of legislation we've been chewing on a long time. That's also helpful. Again, I'm like what? I'm like which ones? Um, again, I'll ask the Secretary of Energy, but I'd say <laughs> let's look at the CAFE standards that were raised in 2007. That doesn't seem, I think, to most experts to be sufficient, and certainly the timeline is very long. Perhaps we could do something well, to say we're going to try to hasten that. But again, I'm out, out, out of my lane, so I'd well, like to get. Back in, in 2008, if I remember correctly, in early 2008, Mayor Bloomberg of New York 
wanted to have a set of proposals that would have restrict, in effect, the effect would have been to restrict traffic in Manhattan. Now, he, he wasn't successful politically because of the state legislature, but I, I suspect, Mr. Secretary, that there are a fair number of those kinds of measures which, in the aggregate, probably represent a reasonable... Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, there am are. I right that, that we consume about 10 million barrels of oil a day for transportation? Well, it's two-thirds of the, the 21 million, so it's more than that. So actually. it's 14 million. <laughs> So there is, a, there is a big target to shoot at, and I rather suspect that if you put all these things together, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the proposal that was used some, quite some time ago about you had a uh, ride sharing or something. If you were well, that's a, there, there are some things clear things that we could be encouraging uh, and, and with incentives, and by the way, the political support for them will rise as the price rises, uh, but that's one reason why I don't think you want to put all of the guns on, shoot them all off at once. You want to uh, pace this, especially if we expect to get worse. But very clearly, one thing we ought to be doing is we ought to internally be gathering the information on just uh, what is the uh, the weight of the, the uh, in the mass transit systems in the major cities. It may well be an emergency appropriation which gets uh, buses back on the highway faster uh, because they're they don't have the money to repair them. These are real problems in the mass transit system that exist now that we might be able to accelerate some proposition, not in a day or a week, but there are a variety of these kind of things that we ought to pull together and uh, uh, Frankie will keep the appropriations committee busy if we... Just so we're clear, I, I'm I think you got to recognize two things. Yes, there surely are a bunch of things you can do that will affect over time if you do them how much oil is used. My question was, does anybody really think it's going to matter to how the rest of the world responds? My guess is that if we actually did a whole bunch of cafe standards and so forth, the Saudis would think, oh my God, we better push the, we better reduce our supplies to make sure the price of oil doesn't collapse. So I'm not sure. That, I think it's probably counterproductive with respect to the, to, the, to the Saudis. I may be wrong and others may have a different judgment, but I don't think we can make an assumption. The other thing that I, I just would like us all to pause for a second on is this administration, rightly or wrongly until now, has been content with the current level of CAFE standards. And in part because we need the automobile industry on our national health insurance legislation for other reasons. I think we need to think, I think we need to think very carefully about because some terrorist blows up a ship, this administration is changing its opinion on fundamental issues of national policy in a 36-hour period during the crisis. I'm not sure that that would send quite the signal of strength for the president that Joe's very concerned about signaling. So I'm very worried about flailing and sending signals of major <laughs> policy redirection all in 24 hours. I think we should agree not to flail. <laughs> uh, but, uh, CAFE standards would be, a, obviously, is, is a very extremely important issue with respect to the longer term. It wouldn't be an immediate response because of the enormous lead times. Is, 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 I, I think I just say I something th here? Because I, this was not a meteor. It was not a hurricane. This was not an act of God that is disturbing the market. This was a deliberate act. Uh, and uh, if he doesn't show awareness of the motives here and the possibility for those motives to act out on a larger scale and only talks about the economics and what happened in the Carter administration. And I, 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 I don't think we're, we're talking about that and I don't think we have to fundamentally change national policy in the next hour. But let's recognize that national policy has been developed not out of strength but out of weakness. But you know, w w there, are solutions to these, there are solutions to these problems and they've been stuck for decades uh, because of lack of political will. So the question is, once we get the baseline uh, things we need to get done, particularly on the anticipating future problems, what do we want to say to the public about how we're going to look at this? And how can we and will we use this as an opportunity? Because the bottom line is our, the, the public support for change in policy isn't linear. It moves quickly based on events in the world. It does not, it's not logical, it's not predictable. It will move when these opportunities come along and if you have the leadership to take them, you, you, you've, done your, you've done your job well, but if you sit back and, and, and worry about getting everything right, then you're gonna miss the opportunity. Be, be, Mr. Before we turn to you, just one thing. Just so we don't, we've gotta get the present pretty quickly and there's, there's a whole other piece of this which we've touched on but haven't quite gotten into. 
Would you recommend, Mr. Secretary, that we immediately deploy assets to protect global energy infrastructure in conjunction with others, assuming that you can find through the Secretary of State and other means ways of acting multilaterally? I would. Or would Let me you say wait? Two, two additional things about that. That takes some time because it takes some time to position forces. So if you want to have that capability and other options a week from now, two weeks from now, when and if another shoe drops, you, you do need to move now and you need to be explained why you're moving. That's point one. Point two was, and, uh, and, and the Secretary of State's been right on this point from the beginning, it's important that we not do it ourselves. So in the Straits of Malacca, for example, we have a number of, we have the Indians whom we have held naval exercises with for the first time in the history of our relationship since the birth of the state of India just in the last two years. What a terrific thing. Uh, in the um, Gulf, uh, we are operating now with NATO navies in support of other things that we're doing there. So n nothing that we do should be a ne or needs to be cast as us acting uh, alone. It seems to me it's terribly important to keep the spirit going that this is a global crisis uh, that affects everyone and these actions can be taken. Now, of course, we're the preponderant Navy. We'll, we will matter most, but that doesn't need to be the headline. The headline ought to be that we're working with these other countries. And that's a very good way of taking advantage, of making lemonade out of this, this lemon. Instead of thinking of all the things we oughtn't to do at this juncture, and I, I respect your prudence and, uh, and so forth, you can turn it around and say, what, let's, let's turn the tables and ask the, the Secretary of the Treasury and the Secretary of Energy, what is it that you've had in your upper right-hand desk drawer that you've wanted to get done that makes sense, not things that don't make sense, but that do make sense, that this can be the opportunity to do. We could add to that adding, uh, bringing China into this picture very clearly because they're now 10 percent of the world oil consumption and they are not members of the IEA, which is of course the consuming nations of the OECD. And so at the G8 that might be one thing uh, if the Secretary of State and others agree that could be done as just one more step of trying to engage them in this process. Is there any probability that we will have more in understanding of who has precipitated this, which then might give us some sense of whether there are further problems that lie ahead or not? Probably not in the near term. It has uh, a number, the attack had a number of Al-Qaeda trademarks, um, so I think we are certainly leaning in that direction. But we can't rule out other possible attackers. We can't rule out a uh, PKK motive, for example, or other independent actors trying to stir up, stir up trouble. So no, we're, in the near term, we are not going to know with any definition who it is. Mr. Secretary, two two comments, uh, if I could. First, uh, and this is way out of my area, but it seems to me that in terms of projecting the president's strength, somebody pretty terrible has done a terrible thing. And I would hope it was the policy of the United States to seek to figure out who that was and to retaliate appropriately. And I would hope that the President was strong in conveying that message. I suspect it is going to be hard, but it seems to me that um, while President Bush did a lot of things wrong, his strength in focusing right after September 11th on the fact that something terribly wrong had happened and that the nation needed to respond was appropriate, and that needs to be an important, that isn't something we've emphasized Absolutely. in this conversation, but I think it's something that has to be an important part of uh, the President's message, and in fact, if it is, that can carry some of the need for leadership and leadership and strength and response that I think uh, Joe is looking for. I, I think, with respect to what... Just one question on that, though, sir. If you don't know who to respond against, doesn't that make it a touch more difficult? That's the kind of difficult question you always ask, Mr. Advisor. But um, uh, I'm not proposing dropping bombs indiscriminately. I, I'm <laughs> suggesting, as I think you recognize, I think the suggestion is that we are going to make, that our intelligence agencies, I don't know if this is in my area, but I, I suspect the Secretary of Defense could, and the head of the National Intelligence could flesh out what one says, but I assume it would involve lots of collaboration with other countries to identify as best one can, to be prepared to take action, to insist that those who harbor the terrorists who did this will face severe consequences. I think there's a muscular thing, set of things uh, to convey. What should we do? Look, ironically, in this situation, uh, it's been 
Our view at the Treasury is I think it's been most economic experts' view that if the United States placed higher taxes on energy, that that would be the most concrete thing we could do to reduce our dependence and that that would actually be a better way to reduce dependence than a lot of 55 mile an hour speed limits and cafe standards and the like. And so if the President really wanted to take an action that would bring us into substantial international concert with others, he would suggest that consideration be given uh, to a gasoline tax. I think that's going to be very hard politically given that the problems being, def I think we do need to get straight whether we're defining the problem as prices that are too low so we waste energy or whether we're defining the problem as prices that are too high so that we burden consumers and we're a little confused about that in making policy but in principle the answer to the Secretary of Defense's question is raise taxes. Well, with, all, well, with all due respect, I don't think we'll have the Secretary of Treasury standing next to the President at his at his state. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fair enough. But well, but you know, I, I, I just got news that there's there's something happening out in the Middle East. Uh, maybe we should try to ascertain what that is. Welcome back to GNN, where we are tracking a late-breaking development out of the Middle East. We're getting reports of a string of terrorist attacks in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states that appear to have targeted the region's oil infrastructure. So far, 12 separate incidents have been reported today, leaving at least 75 foreign nationals dead and 190 wounded. Taken together, the attacks represent some of the worst terrorist violence in the region since the Riyadh bombings in 2003. They left 35 dead and 160 wounded. Joining me now is our Middle East Bureau Chief, Serene Sabah. She's monitoring the situation from Amman in Jordan. Serene, give us the latest details on these attacks. Simon, we are witnessing what appears to be a bold and coordinated sequence of attacks against the very oil infrastructure that lies within the Gulf states' wealth. We still don't have enough information about these attacks, but what we know are three compounds, al baqiq Rawar, and Shaibe, all major oil production sites in Saudi Arabia have been badly damaged. This is not the first time terrorists have struck at compounds housing expatriate oil workers, but it certainly seems to be the most deadly chain of events that we have yet witnessed. Serene Sabah reporting from Amman. Thank you very much indeed. We will keep monitoring the situation in the Gulf. But I want to turn now to our business editor, Suzanne Chislett in London. Uh, Suzanne, what's the likely impact of these attacks on oil projects in the region? Well, Simon, in a word, chilling. There are 100,000 uh, Western and Japanese oil workers working in Saudi Arabia today. Some 65,000 of those come from the United States and the UK. Now, it's the day-to-day -day tasks which are done by the locally employed staff, things like pumping the oil, collecting it, storing it, loading it onto the transportation trucks. But it's these expat workers that do the more advanced work, the expansion, the exploration, uh, and of course repairing the critical machinery. Now they're also the way by which new Western technology can flow into Saudi Arabia. So they really are quite key to the smooth flowing of Saudi Arabian oil onto the world markets. Uh, attacks like we've seen today seem determined to directly undermine the security of these staff working in Saudi Arabia. We're hearing reports from the State Department that the U.S. may evacuate American contractors from Saudi Arabia. What impact would that have? Well, obviously, it could create uh, a short-term impact on the Saudi oil industry, but it also could have a longer-lasting impact on the production potential of this country. These skilled workers aren't easy to replace, especially when personal security is a major issue, as it's now become. And so it does seem like uh, these attacks really are a sign to keep these expat workers out of the kingdom. Suzanne Chislett, our business editor in London. Thanks for that. It seems that the world may not be able to count on an uninterrupted supply of energy from the Gulf after all of this. More on this breaking story as events develop. Stay with GNN. Well, we now have the context that we discussed the, the possibility of a moment ago or a little bit ago, which is that there would be further events. We, we've sort of framed the debate a little bit about whatever we do probably should be multilateral, not unilateral. 
Uh, that's number one. That's not a debate. And number two, should we be more inclined to act now or to create the framework within which we could act but hold off for a little bit to see how markets react? And we've, we've seen that's a, that's a spectrum and their points of view along the spectrum. How does this affect? And then, of course, should we act immediately in the, in, in the whole national security area and, and military protection, one thing or another? All right, how does what just happened change anybody's view on any aspect of this? If, if I could uh, inject for just a moment, um, even greater than the disruption of the oil supply, the attacks in Saudi Arabia, I think, signal uh, an intent to overthrow the House of Saud. And that is a much more difficult problem for us than anything that we've discussed um, to date. So I believe that that has to be now the driving concern that we have to deal with in the near term as we prepare the president to deal with this issue. Well, but let me ask both you, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, does that mean that we should immediately, hopefully working with others around the world, put military resources into the Middle East as quickly as we can? And furthermore, can you do it unless you're invited? I mean, there are a whole host of questions that come out of this. Can I, uh, can I, yep. uh, everything depends now upon the integrity of the Saudi government because there are, yes, several tens of thousands of Americans and many tens of thousands of uh, other non-Saudis working there, but the, the internal security of Saudi Arabia depends upon the Saudi National Guard, which is 70,000 strong or so. They're the ones who have the job of, of securing the oil fields. Now, we have helped them over time. They've never liked us to be there helping them shoulder by shoulder. They might change their mind about that. They will not change their mind about having letting others than us. This is one place where our multilateralism, we can do that offshore, but when it comes onshore, we're the only military that has ever cooperated with the Saudi military. That would have to be permissive by them. That would be a last resort by the Saudi government. What they're going to try to do is count upon their own National Guard. And we can help them in a quiet, selective way. But if they're not able to, uh, to uh, enlist the help of the National Guard in putting an end to this and re-establishing uh, the oil infrastructure, then we're in a whole other world of, of literally doing it ourselves. And that's a, 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 a very substantial uh, undertaking. I, is this is this a movement on a spectrum? So we've now ratcheted up somewhat, or is this sort of a step function where we're now into really a, a national a, 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 a international crisis of, of a wholly different magnitude that we were talking about just a bit ago, Madam Secretary? I'd just like to respond to that. Um, I agree completely with the Director of National Intelligence and the Secretary of Defense that this is about the stability of the Saudi regime. I think the first thing we need to do is probably recommend to the President that he talk to King Abdullah because I think it really will be a question of whether the King thinks that more American forces in Saudi Arabia is going to help him or actually undermine him in this situation. Um, we will be dealing very shortly with the question of evacuating American citizens from Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. And we will probably need uh, U.S. forces to do that. There may be some way that having that contingent of forces ostensibly for the evacuation of Americans could provide uh, the Saudis a little bit of extra oomph without actually having the king call for it. But I think we, we have to ascertain what the king thinks is going to be useful right now before uh, we take any actions on that front, because it could help or, or hinder. This, this, thing, uh, this thing after this, I think, is at a different level. And I'd say three things. First, we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can now to protect the infrastructure, to keep the tankers going, to do all of that. Uh, we should be proposing to Congress tomorrow an insurance program modeled after the airline insurance program after September 11th that will support all of that infrastructure. Related to that, and this is my second point, I don't know, I don't know much about these contractors and so forth, but there are a lot of pretty tough guys who are in this. Some of those guys are going to want to stay, and they're going to want to keep producing oil, and we don't want to be stopping them um, from staying. So we've got to be quite careful how we handle this evacuation plan. We shouldn't be forcing men working on those oil fields to be evacuating and making it harder if, uh, if they don't want to. I, I'm sure that's not your intention, Madam Secretary, but some of the ways that's been talked about have, con have been a little unclear. I agree and with that. I, that's, a, that's a project of several weeks. Uh, it's something that's difficult to reverse. It's something that uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, betrays a, 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 the American view that the Saudi kingdom couldn't hold up. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that we remotely are at the point of, of uh, 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 that. We're, our, everything we do now should be to try to enlist and make it possible for the Saudi government to do the right thing, which is to restore order in the eastern areas where the oil infrastructure is uh, and um, uh, hang in there against whatever uh, 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 insurrection or, or whatever is going on. I, I'd, and I'd say and I'd say one last thing, and I'm just back from a G20 meeting where I heard a lot about from the other world, rest of the world about how they were thinking about the United States these days. For reasons we all understand, we are none too popular. Knowing that we're for something sometimes makes it harder for people to do things. And we need to be way careful, way careful, that in showing that the president's a strong leader, we don't paint people into a corner. There may well be plenty of stuff we want the Saudis to do that they're happy to do, but that will become impossible for them to do if we get caught asking for it. Or if when they do it, they think that we're going to explain how they did it because of a bunch of tremendous American leadership. And so we've got to be very careful how we manage uh, the diplomatics. I mean, they still, rem they still remember when a former energy secretary held a press conference to announce that he was doing quiet diplomacy um, <laughs> to jawbound down the price of energy. And we got to be very careful about not making those mistakes. That's an interesting question, though, Madam Secretary. Is the world going to be in the posture the Secretary just set out? Or, and maybe I'm the only one who reacts this way, is this so much of a potential crisis for the global economy that the world is actually going to look to the United States, all of the stipulating that everything the Secretary said that is, is is correct in, in, in recent history. Look to look the United States to provide leadership. Uh, my feeling is that the world will be looking to us to provide leadership, certainly. That doesn't take away from the Secretary of Treasury's point about the sensitivity of, of dealing with the Saudi regime. So we have to be perceived to be active, to be on the offensive here in a variety of different ways. But again, that doesn't mean that we'll, we need to look like we're telling people what they have to do. Um, just on the evacuation point, um, I'm not saying that we should have mandatory evacuation of all Americans, but certainly we will need to have some provisions for uh, at least non-essential personnel and other, other Americans who will want to leave at this point. Okay, can I raise uh, another, we keep talking about this world crisis. Uh, you know, we've, we've been at this for less than a year. So let's take a second on this is a crisis in the presidency. This president's uh, legacy will be defined by, in some part, the advice we give him not in the, just in the next hours, but in the next months. So it seems to me we have a consensus that we have to demonstrate leadership. We have to show that, the, that this president is on top of this and has a short-term plan. But if you look at what we just watched, there is, there, it seems to me there's now an imperative here uh, that if he doesn't come out and aggressively, without sp specifics, but aggressively say that this is a call to break our dependence on oil, and change our energy policy and to lead the world in doing that, that if we can't even set, you know, the right framework from the beginning, there's no way we'll ever be successful. So I think, you know, we, we, we do need a, a number of measures to, to give people something to chew on, that things are going to happen. But there, this, it seems to me now unmistakable that we've got to make this, this is, this is now reached a, this is now big. The president has to be bigger. Uh, in framing this issue and, and how we're going to look at it. And if we get tactical uh, about it, we'll get eaten up by it. Let me, we we're really running, starting to run out, of, well, not starting, we are running very close to running out of time. We've got to go see the president very shortly. That takes us into what I think we should spend at least a few minutes on, which is whatever decisions he may make about the short run. But let me ask you, I wasn't quite sure what you were, so you're saying on the short run, which is now, what do we do immediately? Forget the long moment that for now, he should have specific measures. He should have specific measures to talk about what we're doing to protect uh, the the rest of. And what the, about the, what the, about the, the other two areas, conservation and Sproul? And uh, you know, I think I, I don't think it means very much for the president to stand up there and say we should all conserve until he has an idea of what. I mean, I'm not sure that we we've had a, some derogatory statements about the failure of President Carter. I, I'm not sure it was the public's failure. I think it was the government's failure to follow on with anything serious. So if we can come to some agreement on SPRO, that would be good. If we can't, we could certainly have the President instructing the Secretary of Energy to, pr to present him with a plan within the next 48 hours. And is your comment the same on conservation? 
I, I, I think I, I think that that is actually the segue to rather than having something like going to the 55 miles, saying that he's calling the congressional leadership down, and we're going to have a new policy, and we're going to break this dependence, and, he, and speak broadly and rhetorically, and then we then we better well do it. Okay, let me. We're, we're very close to me. I think he needs to. It, reassurance is no longer enough, and it's very likely we have to change behavior. The marketplace is going to viciously change that behavior. What we have to be ready, the president's going to be ready to do, is help facilitate that, and not to take all the responsibility on the White House or the co government to do it, but start bringing in the leaders of labor, the leaders of business, the leaders of, of the NGOs, the environmental movement ought to be out there, not calling on the government mandates, but calling on individual citizens to take action, to shift to public transportation, ride sharing. Uh, industries can do a lot, and it's now in their self-interest, and that's what we've got to wrap up together, is their self-interest and our national interest together. But, Mr. Secretary, would you, that sounds very, at least to my, you're very sensible, but, but would you also have mandatory speed limits, ride sharing, and all the rest? Or you, you, you it's make very it. difficult to have mandatory ride sharing and try to enforce that, but, but we, I think that's a place where you want to get the congressional leadership in, put them on the spot to help do it. They, they will have to defend all that back home far more than we will, I can assure you, and that's a good test of whether these things are workable is to get them on the line. We, we only have a few minutes left, and I think this is all a very good segue to, to uh, the, the, <laughs> the final question, which we uh, are a small part of the whole, but nevertheless important. As he talks to the country around this, what should he be? What, what should we recommend to him, both substantively and politically? He might say about longer-term measures. How do we not be in the same position five years ago, five years from now, or three years from now, but to a much greater degree because of all the various possibilities for interrupting a global supply? What kinds of long-run measures? Well, firstly, do we think he should use this as an opportunity to call for the nation to undertake difficult measures for the long run? And if we do, do it very briefly, what kinds of long-run measures should we? recommend that he at least at this point consider and then perhaps propose? Secretary? No. Secretary Trace, has got to be it's, it's 12 hours after the attack. Do not. We need to be awfully careful about reorganizing the fire department during the fire. So I don't think the main focus of his remarks should be the long run first. Second, it is unfortunately true, Professor Bill Hogan, every expert will tell you that the probability that we will not be dependent on Middle Eastern oil 10 years from now is zero. No matter what the President of the United States does, no matter what policy we have, it is zero. And therefore, setting that as a goal is committing him to failure, with the failure being more embarrassing the more strongly the goal is set. There are things he, uh, he should be looking at. He should be looking at tax measures that promote uh, energy efficiency. He should be looking at supply-based policies um, off the Gulf Coast uh, in Alaska that we've been uncomfortable with, but it's a different world now. He should be looking at coal technology and carbon capture that will let us go back to using coal uh, where we didn't before. He should be calling for a major increase in energy research and uh, development around, um, around renewables. If he wants to do really the right thing, he will say that we are not going to try, except for those who are disadvantaged, to cushion the impact of higher prices because it's the very effect of higher prices that will lead to increased efficiency. <coughs> so cushion it for the disadvantaged cushion it for those who've been suddenly affected, but he should say, we Americans are going to have to get used to higher priced energy. And if he does that, he really will have a very important legacy in this area. You know, you raise an interesting question, Mr. Secretary. If you want substantial change in behavior and investment in conservation and alternatives and all that kind of stuff, people have to think the prices are going to be higher on a sustained basis, not just right now. Should he go out and promise the American people that he'll keep prices high? through taxes and other means so not, that... Not tomorrow. <laughs> Let's wait a couple you, of days. You wouldn't, you wouldn't put that in the initial... No, but there's actually a serious long-term issue that yeah, on the one absolutely. hand, everybody wants lower prices. On the other hand, you're only going to get the kinds of measures, that, I mean, the kinds of investments over that you need. Look, we, we can't work this all out here in 10 minutes before we see the president, but the right policy for America here is as people get used to these high prices, which are going to be with us for some time, 
for us to have a set of policies that as the OPEC prices come down, our taxes go up. We probably never could have put taxes on in a way that would push the price up by, of gasoline by a dollar, but maybe we can keep, maybe we can put taxes on in a way so that when this passes, we don't make the mistakes of substantially increasing our dependence I, I, that we have in the past. But I don't think that's for this moment. I, I think, for, as Madam a, Secretary, I, we will stop this out of politics. Sure. Um, <laughs> just very quickly on what he should say today. Again, I just want to reiterate the importance of tone that this is a global problem. This is not an us versus them. This is not attack on America. This is a global problem. We sat here uh, just an hour and a half ago to talk about preparations for a G8 meeting. I think in the course of events, we should maybe have a different kind of proposal. I mentioned bringing China and India on board, but maybe we should bring some of the world's top producers there to have a, a conversation about the integrity of the global oil market. Because again, I think you know what he can do now is not solve the problem, but set the right tone so we can solve the problem. And then uh, looking ahead, I just want to underscore how when I look through and have talked to my ambassadors and assistant secretaries, there are many places in which we've been unwilling to change energy policy and the consequences been we're going to have to do some of that unless we want to change a lot of our national security policy. I mean, there's a real tension here. And we haven't really begun to grapple with it. So I know we'll get together at future meetings to talk about some of the issues where these two things are really in conflict. Mr. Lockhart. <coughs> you know, I, I think this is, you know, there's a fundamental question here. Um, it, it may seem politically <laughs> crazy to go out and say we want to keep gas prices high. And it's not, it's so crazy that it may just be smart. The, the, the real question is, uh, you know, the, if you look at, at our political history, the public will always respond if they believe you're committed, that you're taking the problem seriously and they believe you're committed to solving the problem. Uh, so as a poli my political advice is, if we can get serious about this, then let's put the president down this path. If we can't, if the politics and the special interests and all of the ways we've been doing things and uh, our worry about this state and that state are, are going to overwhelm us, and we have to take a much smaller approach and just try to ride the crisis out. And that is a fundamental decision the president has to make. You know, the, the Secretary of Treasury made the comment, I think that's very well put. The Secretary of Treasury made the comment you can't reorganize the fire department during the fire. It, it maybe it's the only time you can reorganize the fire department. And I, I don't know. I mean, that's two, you know, different points of view on that. But. I think there is a, f is there a possibility we could really use, that the President could use this to change the debate in America about long-term oil dependence? Obviously, as you said, Mr. Secretary, you, you're not going to be free of dependence on the Mideast, but the question is can you reduce it to some extent? Maybe that's the question. Is nuclear energy a possibility here for the longer run? Is there some way to expedite the development of new nuclear capability, or is that so long-term as not to be relevant? Well, it's certainly we have, for the first time in, since 1979, we have nine applications before the NRC for new power plants. Uh, now, nothing can expedite that too much other than uh, it frankly depends on the financial community to be willing to make sure they will finance those new plants. But to keep that up and not give in to those political forces that are trying to undermine the supportive policy of getting those plants in place, it seems to me is at least a minimal step that we could take. Let me make a suggestion. We have about a minute or two before we have to go see the <laughs> President. And I think what I'd like to suggest is that we present this to him as some very big issues, or some very big choices that he has got to make, and I think we've sort of outlined them. But most fundamentally, how active does he want to be both with respect to the short run and the long run in response to what now looks like it could be a global crisis? with respect to conservation, strategic petroleum reserve, and what he calls on other nations to do with respect to protecting global infrastructure, and then with respect to the long term, where does he want to put himself in the spectrum of possibilities? Now, does anybody want to add something to that or frame it somewhat differently? I mean, you know, within that comes all the, the, the particulars that we've discussed. Uh, Mr. Secretary. You'll, you'll do it in the way you, you think uh, best, Mr. National Security Advisor, and you, I think, have an orientation on this issue. I'm not sure that presenting the case to the President as with respect to a major crisis 
does he want to take the active or the inactive route <laughs> is entirely fair to those of us who feel that many of the measures that he would propose could be very counterproductive. <coughs> and so I would s respectfully suggest that you might frame the issue for the President in terms of how much of what will clearly be a comprehensive and major set of steps that his administration will take does he want to attempt to lay out in detail immediately and how much does he want to point to the gravity of the problem while maintaining his uh, flexibility with respect to the other issues and I, I would respectfully urge that from a lot of people's point of view who haven't been deliberating about this as policy wonks for an hour and a half um, there were some terrorists somewhere who today potentially wrecked the world economy and what they're going to want to know is whether the president is focused on addressing them and it's of course it's hard we're not going to know who they are and all of that the projection of strength around that is actually going to be central and how he addresses that issue uh, is one that I hope you'll lead him to focus on as well. Mr. I, I uh, agree with that. Uh, you mentioned this before, but I think it's really important part of the style of leadership of this president who's promised something new is be an inclusive kind of leadership that is going to reach out to business, labor, academic leadership and bring in expertise. There is nobody in America today who believes the president has all the answers. They might have when we were growing up, they don't today. And, and the biggest mistake you can make is have a closed system. So we have got to get a network of uh, going and that's going to be take effective management from the White House, from each of our departments to make that happen. Would you, let me ask you this if I may, Mr. Secretary, could you, you had a, before this job you were had a, a, excuse me, a career in which you spent some time in Congress. Would you be inclined to use the difficulties, which we have now all discussed for an hour and a half, the difficulties of dealing with these sorts of issues when they arise, would you be inclined to use that if you were the president to make the point that we just can't, we've got to do everything we can not to let this happen to us again? Yes, I think so. And I think that's going to be a rhetorical, and, and it's, it's going to be a rhetorical proposition. But, but I well, but then you, if, if you once did that and then set the stage for whatever specifics Absolutely. Whatever, well, first of all, that he wants to call on the American fire people. analogy we had, this is a forest fire that is going to burn for weeks, if not months. So the point is we don't have to reorganize it today and tomorrow. We have some time as long as we show that we're demonstratively moving to the reorganization. I think that's the important thing. Okay. Any other Observations? Yes, I, 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 obviously, I think there's a consensus. We've got to convey strength, uh, focus all of that. I think, uh, and that that is a rhetorical exercise, primarily filled in by some some quick policy that we can't announce in detail because we shouldn't, and it's not ready. I think one but, of the things, at least, this left me with as the coordinator of this is is, is the the reflection on on how difficult it is to deal with short-run crisis when it happens, which takes me back to what I was saying a moment ago, independently of what he should or shouldn't do, and we'll, we have different views on that, we'll give it, it, it certainly does suggest, at least to me, that he's got a very serious decision to make. Does he want to try to make himself the agent of change in terms of long-run energy policy well, in the that, country? And, right, and that is the, the second point, which is, and he cannot decide this in our next meeting, but it is a decision he has to come to very quickly, whether he's going to politically try to ride this out uh, which is an acceptable political strategy, knowing the dangers, or t to use this as an opportunity to change and, and, you know, and let's not forget asking for sacrifice and asking for the American people to be part of that, which is politically dangerous. Um, and that's a, but that's a fundamental decision. And what we have to give him is a pretty sober uh, assessment of the political risks, uh, the policy difficulty, because if we have him walk out that walk out to the end of that tree, he's going to be by himself. Uh, but he's, that's something he's got to decide, um, you know, in the next, in the next 24, 48 hours. And then as the Secretary of Defense said, if we're going to, and Secretary of State, that if whatever we're going to do, unless you bring in the rest of the world, none of this works. And if we don't find a way of reducing our dependence, then we become hostage to various other countries in the world with respect to a whole host of other, which was your point before, Madam Secretary, foreign policy considerations. Good. I think we've had a, a very good meeting on a very difficult issue in a very short period of time. And now we will go to the President.
Thank you all. So let me, uh, let me thank our cabinet tonight. I think we would be fortunate in the case of such a crisis if we were to have such a competent cabinet. I think the uh, discussion certainly uh, is of a higher quality than some cabinet meetings that I've observed uh, and maybe even some of our colleagues here. We've got about 12 more minutes for questions. We've got microphones that are roving with a couple of our students. If you've got a brief comment or question, please raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone. And then we'll try to have not everybody answer, but one of you, uh, uh, if we can. So please, here's a yes, stand up and get a microphone right here. Introdu introduce yourself, too. Thank you. My name is Jacob Um so, uh, being on this panel, I would be interested in your thoughts on an energy policy so that in a time like this, in a crisis like this, there is some sort of format to respond to. Because my big takeaway was that you were handling all of this as it came at you. So I kind of wonder, from, your, from each of your prospective roles, being in Washington or being in commerce, what those are and, and, and if there is discussion and thoughts. Given the time, maybe one or two quick shots. I, I would suspect the, the, the mythical president ran with a robust energy policy about reducing foreign, uh, our dependence on foreign oil. He had a bunch of really smart ideas about it and it went nowhere in the first 10 months. Uh, so I would suspect there's already a framework for this, that the president comes to this with some thoughts. The question is, is this, an, is this a moment in time when the president and Congress get serious or, or not? I, uh, the ideas are out there. You don't need to sit and start That's from right. scratch. Mm -hmm. It's the question is, is there a political will? Has, have the planets aligned politically in a certain way where you can shove this stuff through like it has so many other times on so many other issues? Okay. This gentleman, please, and introduce yourself. Yep. My name is Howard Burke uh, with Good Energies. Um, in the section of the discussion with regard to long-term uh, options and, and uh, policy programs, given that the shock was oil and 97% of the consumption of oil is for transportation, I was a bit surprised that there was no commentary about electrified vehicles, particularly projecting into 2009, 2010, and into the next decade. By that time, I would hope that the federal government's policies would be supportive of enhancing the production of electric vehicles. The other aspect of the simulation is I presume you simulated that Hillary Clinton did not run for president well, nor get elected. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just quickly say on that, I mean, first of all, I would hope that what you would have had if there was going to be discussion of long term is some real papers vetting those issues. There's lots been written about and, and worked on and there's some incentives already in play. They probably are not viewed as sufficient enough to get the electric hybrid in place. But uh, we, we were just sort of rushing from one thing to another here and I do hope the conversation would be more disciplined and more sustained uh, with actually something on paper with multiple proposals before a group like this, but maybe I've lived in Congress too long and thought the executive was better organized than it is. <laughs> can, I just, uh, good Larry. can I just uh, strike a slightly dissonant note here? Um, I'm, Shocking. <laughs> I'm all for um, raising taxes, I'm all for research, I'm all for the subsidy for whatever subsidy program to electric cars um, you think is uh, most, uh, most prudent. It's all the right thing to do. Once you've done it, we're still going to, the, the industrial world, which is what matters, there's going to be one world price of oil, and the industrial world is still going to be getting a third or some huge fraction of its energy from the, from the Middle East, no matter what you do. And if you've done it more, you're going to be getting a little less oil from the Middle East. And if you've done it less, you're going to be getting a little more oil from the Middle East. But it's still going to be just as true, just as true, even if we were getting half as much oil from the Middle East as we are today, somebody could still make some straight blow up or some set of tankers blow up, and we'd still be two million tankers short, two million barrels short, and there'd still be a price, and there'd still be just as large a price spike. So I think we need to set our goals realistically. And it is not within the gift 
of plausible public policy in the United States to create a situation where a sufficiently bad geopolitical event in the Middle East will not raise the price of energy by $50 a barrel within a short period of time. We do not have the set of policies that I believe that can be pers that can achieve that goal within the next uh, two decades, which may speak to how large a SPRO we need and may speak to a whole variety of other things. And it doesn't mean that it isn't very important in terms of global warming. It doesn't mean that it isn't very important in terms of reducing the ultimate burden we're paying with our energy policies to do a whole set of these uh, measures. But I think if you're trying to hold out the prospect that somehow if somehow we can create a world where if somebody decides to bomb the Straits of Hormuz, the price of oil isn't going to spike in a way that's extremely vulnerable, that's not happening within my lifetime. Could, could I ask you a question, I think that's Larry? widely that's agreed upon, by the way, by many, many people who have looked at this, and both political parties do not believe that we can fundamentally, we can mitigate these risks and we can deal with some questions, but we cannot uh, get out of a highly risky situation that this kind of scenario yeah, applies. Yeah, that, that I can understand, but it does seem to me that if you, and I'm no expert in any of this stuff, but it does seem to me, if, oil production today is what, 80, 80 million barrels of all a day or something like that? Yeah. Okay, so if, if what we do with 80 million today, we could do with 60 million, I mean, I'm just making up numbers, but you pick your numbers, 60 million five years from now, which is, I'm sure, unrealistic, but let's say you could. The, the expectation we're going to go to 130 million in, by 2030. Okay, so but, I, but I'm, I'm trying to make a conceptual point, not a question of the actual numbers. If you had a 2 million interruption, it seems to me that you'd be less affected by it, and the price of oil would be less affected by it, the less oil that you have per dollar of GDP. I don't know if that's right or not, but it seems to me it should be right. In fact, we've reduced that. I mean, the United States has actually seen a downward in the, in the intensity use of oil. It's much less today than it was in 1970. But when you get this kind of a situation, you still do a lot. I, 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 I think, actually, in a strict sense, what you said is right and what I said is right. What I said was, it would still be true that the price of oil would spike by fifty dollars right. and what you said is it's probably true that if we become less energy dependent a fifty dollar increase in the price of oil would do less damage to the economy than it would have yeah. than it would have before and that's true but you know if we were using sixty million barrels rather than eighty million dollars it'll sort of do three quarters as much uh, damage as it did. That's why it's still a good thing. T it's still a good thing to do, but the sort of implication that somehow there's the possibility of not being dependent on the volatile Middle East and not facing the prospect of these huge spikes. That's what I I think. Um, I think 90% of the experts let me, will agree with you on that. Let me go to Karen. We'll agree, with, we'll agree that that's not attainable. Let me go to Karen House, who's just come back from Saudi. Yeah. I just want to ask a, uh, ask a question of the Secretary of State. Uh, this started out with the Bosphorus incident, and you said Prince Saud told you that he wanted a little movement, perhaps, on Middle East policy. When the blow-ups start occurring in Saudi Arabia, does he diminish his demand for policy change or increase his demand for <laughs> policy change? Well, you would probably be better positioned to answer that than I, but my guess is that with the second incident, the situation changes pretty dramatically and that Saudi Arabia is actually um, a, sort of on the defensive or a victim of the situation. Um, however, you could find that when the Saudis looked at what is going to shore up their regime, they may have a tendency to look outside. You know, they may say, again, if you could make some progress on Middle East peace, that's going to be the best thing for us to hold down a dissatisfaction in our country. You know, the realities are it's probably more of an economic thing. It's probably more of a um, question of how they're dealing with um, some extremism in their country there. But my guess is on, on the whole, the situation would change and the conversation would change after the second set of events. But there still could be some pressure to do some things differently. Let's go to the loge up here. Hello, I'm Robert Hefner. That was great. Uh, Phil Sharp might know about what I'm about to say. Uh, 
In listening to this entire uh, discussion, there was uh, one, I think, great omission, and that is the United States is natural gas abundant like it is with coal. And we've got a 2.2 million mile distribution system that delivers natural gas to over 100 million vehicles. And with a change in tanks, instead of liquids, you put in a scuba tank for natural gas and a home compressor, and you've got a dual fuel vehicle. And <clears throat> many of the automobile companies already manufacture production models. So it is an alternative that could be scaled up within about a decade and uh, I think displace about 20 or 30 percent of the oil for the transportation sector. Could I ask you a question? Sure. What, what would give them the incentive, the, oil, the, the automobile companies, what would give them the incentive to, do, to scale up in the, in, the, in, the, in the manner you just described? Well, several of them already produce a natural gas vehicle. Yeah, but you're, say, you're saying scale up so to have the, the, the major effects that you mentioned. What, what would give them the incentive to do that? Well, I think the incentive would be consumers because natural gas has traditionally followed the price of oil at about a 50 percent discount. But they, well, I guess what I was getting, getting at is to get back to Larry's point before. Well, you have to find some way of assuring tax the industry that, that, ta that the oil price of oil remain high. That was my point. A gasoline tax would be the most effective, of course. Yeah, that, that was kind of my... my Robert Hefner proved the uh, conventional wisdom of the oil and gas industry wrong about 40 years ago that you could actually find deep gas and get it up at an economical basis. And okay, another one in the loge, please. Uh, I'm Fred Eisman. Um, my question is, if you take the oil shock out of it and just assume that oil prices are going to 200 or $250 because of oil demand going to 130 million <coughs> barrels a day over the next 10 years. We've seen how the Canadian oil sands, for instance, have been able to produce enormously as oil has gone from 20 to $120. Are there other, and one hears that, for instance, under the Rocky Mountains, there's enough oil at the right price to vastly uh, uh, outweigh what we import from Saudi Arabia. What are, the, what are the sources of potential oil in a rising price environment, is my question. Well, I mean, uh, there is the shale oil, and there's, by the way, shale gas as well. Uh, one thing we're going to be up against is an issue we haven't even talked about here. It's barely been mentioned, is the climate change issue and whether we're going to take the carbon out. One of the difficulties is with shale oil and uh, tar sands is that they take more energy to get them out. They're more intense uh, emitters of carbon dioxide as a result than normal gasoline is. And so unless you're going to have a carbon-constrained policy in which those are developed, so that perhaps you're using nuclear in uh, the tar sands in Alberta, a very expensive proposition at the moment, uh, to, to heat the oil, to get it out of there, you've, you're just compounding another major problem that, uh, frankly, I think is going to be of compelling concern uh, to policymakers and especially the next administration unless uh, the oil market goes uh, uh, kaplooey on them. But there are lots of uh, sources, and then you can get <laughs> deeper and deeper in a, uh, the Outer Continental Shelf. If you wish, you can go into the Arctic. But there are other values that some people are bringing to bear in these debates uh, about uh, how much, uh, what, what it does to nature and uh, other risks that people are worried about. So it's always a trade-off. At the moment you get into this crisis, the trade-off becomes very easy. Everything's for oil. Uh, but the minute you're outside of that uh, crisis, uh, then it's a quite different uh, values and political uh, issue. So over here in the corner. I think uh, I just wanted to say something. I'm not an, an, an oil expert, but I've observed uh, 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 that people told me that at $50 a barrel, there would be investment in all this new stuff, and then it was $100 uh, <coughs> a barrel, and it doesn't happen. And that tells me to the, uh, that there are two critical ingredients there. One is the expectation of sustained high prices, but that's not enough. I think there has to be some political catalysis as well, which an event like this provides the opportunity for. And I think that had we been able to go on longer, I always think of a cr crisis has a, a, a defense and an offense. You play defense to try to mitigate a crisis. But if you're smart, you play offense, too, and say, what does this give me the opportunity to do that I know is right that I haven't gotten away with yet? 
That's why I said and, to Larry's thing. And, and Larry, Larry quite rightly uh, was being cautious about not doing the wrong thing. He also, I think, quite rightly cautions against suggesting that by doing the right thing, you're going to uh, end our dependency on it. So there has to be some other frame for why doing the right thing leads to good results. It doesn't lead to an absence of of dependency. But there's a, so that's on the economic side and the energy side, and I don't have anything more to say on that. On the strategic side, it seems to me that Megan really uh, started us off on the right note, which is that the oil dependency is not an American problem. Oil dependency is a global problem. We are better positioned to deal with it as a strategic matter now, never with the enduring dependency. We are better positioned to deal with that if it's framed that way than if we frame it in terms of our own dependency. And that's just a codicil I wanted to add to Larry's very smart observation that if we, this, uh, if we start talk about our dependency, it suggests that we can get relief from it, and none of us knows how to take a path that relieves leads. We, we yeah, should not I, underestimate some that disagree with what Larry said. Because it, obviously, he's right. I mean, you're not going to reduce your dependence. On, I mean, you're not going to eliminate your dependence at oil. But unless we think there's going to be a serious Unless, unless reducing the amount of oil required for each dollar GDP, wherever you want to look at it, in, unless you, can, you think you can accomplish something serious in that respect and make yourself less vulnerable both in terms of, Larry, not only the effect of a, of a particular dollar amount of price increase, but also the degree of price increase that you get from any particular event, unless you believe that, then why would you do any of these things for the long run? Other than global warming and you don't want to eliminate life on Earth, but leaving that one aside. <laughs> well, he's saying, hey, you have to explain to people the difference between less vulnerable and invulnerable. Oh, okay, I agree with that. Yeah, okay, exactly. la last question over here in the corner. Please. Uh, Howard Berkowitz, um, uh, several members of the cabinet suggested that when the moment presents itself or the opportunity presents itself, one should take bold action. Shouldn't the cabinet be uh, presenting to the president the concept that, that he should... Uh, uh, propose to the Congress that there be a mandatory uh, uh, that all new cars starting in 2010 be flex fuel vehicles. Uh, the, automo the automotive companies tell, tell us that it would cost no more than 100 to 110 dollars per automobile to, uh, to turn them into a flex fuel vehicle which would allow you to use any alcohol based fuel uh, at where, at, from a variety of different sources of energy, uh, everything from switchgrass to garbage, uh, as well as coal, uh, to 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 really uh, make a difference in in in, in the m amount of gas gasoline used, and would ch change the whole dependency issue. Uh, I, look. Yeah, the president's going to recommend that that's going to be done by Congress. That's to be done overnight. As long as they take it out of the way it is now, right now it gives the, the companies an out on CAFE standards because we put it into the law in 1986 or 7 uh, as an incentive to get the flex fuel vehicles that are there. Uh, but, but, what you're ex but here's again where the expectations are so out of line with what the policy can really accomplish. You have to have a fuel, by the way, to go into that tank, and that's going to take a, a, wh a while to do it. But but it's not a bad concept, and uh, all the companies will probably do it before long anyway. I'd say, I'd say two things. Uh, one, I think the experience with food riots in 20 countries underway at the moment should suggest some caution yeah. with respect to anything that bears on biofuels that's motivated by U.S. energy uh, considerations needs to be thought through very carefully. The second thing is, on the, I just want to say something on this question of vulnerability and all that. I think there is a case for a whole set of measures to promote energy efficiency. I think the overwhelmingly the most important thing is giving credibility that the price of energy is going to, the consumer price of energy is going to stay relatively high even when the producer price falls as it, prob as it probably will through a whole set of fluctuations. But the argument for it, the, the, the main two arguments for it, I think, are the global warming arguments and that if you buy something from a monopolist, if you reduce your demand, the monopolist will probably reduce its price and you'll get it cheaper. And I think that's where the real argument lies. And most of the stuff about reducing most, most of the stuff about reducing vulnerability, I actually wish 
we could reduce our vulnerability, but I actually think that in a world where there's no way we're going to be importing less than a quarter, where the industrial world is going to be importing less than a quarter of its oil from the Middle East, and where an interruption of 5% of the Middle East supply causes a huge disruption, I think the view that you can somehow substantially reduce vulnerability is probably a bit optimistic. By the way, we should take into account we are already into a very significantly changing oil market on both the consumption and the production end of that because these prices are so high and because they are going beyond what um, analysts had expected them to stay up. The expectation had been they would fall back to $40 a barrel only about two years ago. Now, they may not stay at $118 or whatever it is, but they are already creating a different investment climate in which people are clearly going into shale oil or clearly going into these other production things as well as on the efficiency side and a lot of Americans are actually starting to show that because of the price they will change behavior. Now, I'm not arguing that that's the only way to encourage e efficiency, but if you don't have an adequate price level, you force every other conservation measure, every effort of the government to squeeze people to do something has to be double what it is if, in the, if they are not, if it's not being uh, in conjunction with a price level that actually makes sense to people and they begin to behave according to the price. Price. Let me let Rob have a last word because we're already over. Yeah. Oh, I don't. Help with my last word. <laughs> I guess I have one reaction to all this, Graham. I, I, it may not be entirely everybody else's reaction. I, I think, and, and th I, this is the second one of these I've done. And before I did the first one, I did it because somebody asked me to, and I, I wanted to respond yes to the person who asked me, and I, I, it was a lot of work, and it, it seemed to me it was more work than it was worth doing. Once I did it, I had a very different view. I thought it was enormously worth doing. It, is, it, it gave me a kind of awareness of how vulnerable we are and how much we can be affected by events that are probably reasonably likely to happen. And so it seemed to me that this was something that was worth trying to do as many places as you could and try to create a, a better political environment for actually doing something that is relevant to dealing with our dependence on oil over time. But I suspect, Joe, the politics of actually trying to do anything meaningful, except when the fire is burning, is probably pretty tough. We have a lot of evidence of that. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a very good place to stop. Let's say thank you very much to our cabinet.